So this is Roberto Tron from Boston University, designing feedback-based robust navigation. All right. Can you hear me well? Yes. All right. Uh, thank you so much for organizing the workshop, Nika and Kave, uh, and running it. And uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, today, I'm going to present you um, some work that um, we, we want to apply to vision-based navigation. Uh, and in particular, we are looking at the problem of uh, planning uh, joined with um, controls and uh, vision-based uh, inputs. Um, so the um, problem we are looking at is imagine you have a robot or uh, this is a project we, we are doing in collaboration with um, neuroscientists. So uh, we use also a mouse, sort of like a, a, a robot to model a mouse. Uh, imagine that you have this agent that uh, needs to navigate an environment to get to some rewards to some goal location. Uh, what we mean by learning an environment is that the mouse or the robot can go from wherever it is currently in the environment, any initial position, and uh, uh, can reach the goal without thinking. So just by looking where it is, getting some visual cues from the environment, apply some control, some actions, and uh, successfully navigate uh, to the, um, uh, through the environment while avoiding all the obstacles. And uh, so this needs to be very fast. Like the learning can take quite some time to learn the environment, but then these actions need to be um, very fast. So uh, how we are approaching this? So um, we are, uh, we first assume that we, uh, we're using a control based approach. And so we assume that we have some um, model of the dynamics of the robot. And uh, in this work, we uh, assume a linear dynamical system, which however could be higher uh, order. So, uh, for instance, point mass. Um, and the idea is that you, the robot starts from some location, looks around and uh, gets using vision, uh, um, sees its own uh, position with respect to some landmarks and uh, an environment which are familiar. And then these landmarks uh, give you some measurements. And uh, our goal is to take these measurements, put them into a linear controller and uh, get a linear control uh, uh, and then a control action U. Uh, the point here is that um, we want to learn the co entire controller. So we want to learn this matrix K that will allow us to uh, successfully navigate in the environment. So go from any start location to the goal uh, while avoiding all the obstacles, in this case, all the walls. Um, so uh, this work, it's uh, very uh, it related to traditional work in uh, path planning. Uh, so for instance, in uh, traditional region decomposition methods or uh, three sampling based methods such as RRT. Um, however, um, our approach, we don't focus on nominal paths, but instead we plan entire controllers for the environment. So what this means is that if the um, location of the landmarks is changed a little bit with respect to the map you use for planning, or if there are disturbances in the motion, so for instance, the linear state, uh, linear model um, assumption is not uh, exactly correct, or the robots get pushed uh, outside their nominal path, or if you have uh, errors in the measurement just due to noise, uh, our controller, it's essentially a feedback controller. So you can use the power of feedback control to get, uh, be robust to all these uh, practical shortcomings. Um, and uh, so in practice, what we do is we first, uh, our solution in actual is to start with uh, the environment, um, make a discretization of the environment so that you can use a graph based path planning at high level. Then you get a path in terms of regions, and then you learn a controller for each region that can guide you through this nominal path. And I'll give you the details uh, of all these steps uh, throughout the talk. Uh, the point that I want to highlight here is that every step, uh, it's uh, quite fast um, and uh, also can be solved. Uh, you can have uh, optimality guarantees at every step uh, about the control that you learn. 
So this is the, um, a brief outline of the rest of the, my talk. Uh, I'll start by telling you the basic formulation, uh, really the, um, the core of how our approach. And then uh, we'll see how to um, uh, fix some shortcomings uh, of the basic formulation. In particular, what happens if you don't see all the landmarks or all the time? And uh, how do you deal with the fact that you might have noise in the measurements of the landmarks? And uh, what if you cannot have uh, a nice uh, cell decomposition of the environment uh, easily, uh, what you do in that case? So let's start with the basic formulation. Uh, as I mentioned, so imagine that you have like this corridor-like environment um, that uh, you can divide in, uh, we assume that we can divide this environment in uh, convex regions. Uh, so this essentially a, a standard uh, assumption that many patterning algorithms do. And once you have this decomposition, you can model this environment as a graph. And so from any starting location, so let's say from this cell, you can uh, use uh, Dijkstra or a star to find a path uh, that goes from any starting cell to uh, your uh, cell where the goal is. Um, then in our approach, uh, once you have divided, you have this high level path, this high level path tells you for each region, which is the next region that you should move forward in order to reach your goal. And uh, then we, what we do is we plan, we find a controller that it's uh, active in that particular region and that can guide you toward the next cell while avoiding the walls. And so while, since the first step, it's pretty uh, standard. Uh, in this talk, I'll focus on the more interesting part, which is uh, how to compute the uh, controller for each region. And in particular, we'll have three requirements, three types of constraints uh, for our controller. The first one is convergence, that our um, controller needs to push the robot toward the next cell um, in the path. The second is the, um, uh, it needs to be safety, meaning that it needs to avoid the walls. And third, it needs to satisfy our traitor limits. So, um, uh, at any point in the cell, you, your control should not exceed what the robot can actually perform in order to be able to guarantee stability and safety. Um, so for computing the local controller, again, uh, imagine that you are the robot, uh, represent as the mouse here, and uh, you measure the landmarks. And the landmarks can be any point in the environment, uh, usually are on the... Um, are probably on the surface of the obstacles, but it's not mandatory. And um, you can also use optionally the distance from the wall. So for instance, if you have sonar or any other whiskers or any other type of sensor, uh, contact sensor, you could uh, also integrate these uh, type of measurements in our approach. Uh, the idea is that you take all these measurements, uh, which I represent with the variable y, you stack all these measurements into a vector, you multiply this vector by a controller matrix and you get a control U. And in practice, what this does is that for every point environment, once you fix K, you get a control U and this is the kind of field that you get. And what you want is that for this field to always avoid the walls and always uh, move toward the exit. So that wherever you start in, the, in this cell, you always move toward the next step in your path at the, that you plan at the high level in the cell decomposition. So um, looking at what, how do you actually formulate mathematically these three constraints, uh, making progress. Imagine that, so you have this cell, this rectangle. Um, we represent the exit phase as a plane and uh, we can um, uh, find the normal to this plane, which denote, we denote as N. Then what we can do is to define a Lyapunov function, uh, which is zero at the exit phase and it's linear uh, everywhere else and increases as you increase the distance from the wall. Then what we are going to use is um, uh, a relatively recent but very popular technique, uh, which is um, uh, we use this V as a control Lyapunov function. And the point is that we have the V 
if we can find a control u such that v dot is less than some constant which is uh, strictly uh, which is negative then this will ensure um, uh, convergence toward the wall so if we can enforce this uh, v dot to be negative for any point in the uh, cell then we'll get uh, stability and we'll uh, ensure that we make progress in our path the nice thing about this constraint is that um, if you expand v dot since v is linear then also the derivative is linear and since the dynamics of the system is linear it means that everything it's um, uh, this constraints it's affine with respect to the inputs and this will uh, um, we'll use this fact uh, in a couple of slides the second step is uh, avoid obstacles so we have walls which again we represent as planes we can find a normal and we can define again uh, a distance from the a function which is the distance from the wall and we want these uh, functions to always be positive so if you start from anywhere inside the cell uh, no matter what control you take the distance should be always greater than zero and uh, for this uh, to enforce this constraint we use um, uh, the um, uh, the same form or control Lyapunov of functions but for safety which are control barrier functions and again if you ensure, can ensure that h dot is uh, um, positive sufficiently positive and here in order to make the constraint like um, conservative you can say to be actually larger than uh, the distance to the wall um, if you can enforce this constraint then you're sure that your uh, cell uh, like you it's a forward invariant meaning that if you start on one side of the wall you always keep on one side of the wall and again since this uh, function is linear this uh, dynamics is linear it turns out that these uh, constraints it's also um, affine or linear in the uh, respect to the inputs and again we'll use this in a couple of slides finally you need to satisfy actuation limits and uh, for this we just assume that uh, we can represent the um, uh, actuation limits as polytopic constraints, so just linear inequalities. So now, and again, this since these uh, linear inequality is uh, also affine in the inputs. And so, um, uh, what we can do is to put these constraints all together. So we, um, our goal is to uh, into a minimization problem. So if, uh, we introduce a couple of slack variables which we are trying to make as negative as possible. And the more negative these uh, variables are, the um, more satisfied these constraints are in an intuitive sense. And so we are trying to minimize these slack variables subject to the fact that we want this to be a feedback control law so that the U needs to be a linear matrix times the measurements that are a linear function of the your location X. Then we have our CLF constraints that uh, enforce the robot to always make progress. Then we have the safety constraints uh, that enforce that the um, uh, robot never eats the walls. And finally, uh, we have the um, uh, actuator constraints that we just saw. And um, uh, then we have the constraints that these dots here are computed subject to the dynamics of the robot. Um, the nice thing about this is that, as I told you, every constraint is uh, affine in the U. And since U is affine in K, then it means that uh, this entire optimization problem is uh, just a linear program with respect to K. And so this is very nice because linear programs are well understood. There are very efficient algorithms. and um, you can solve them, uh, they are convex, so you can uh, find, uh, solve them to optimality. Um, however, one uh, uh, caveat is that you need to satisfy these constraints at all locations in these cells. So um, you actually, I wrote this as a set of constraints, but actually this is an infinite set of constraints because for every X in the cell, uh, these constraints should be satisfied. So we can get around this very easily by just substituting these constraints or the constraints that this needs to be satisfied for all access. Uh, 
uh, by first taking a maximization over X and then imposing that the constraint for the um, uh, optimizer uh, satisfy the overall program. So this becomes now a bi-level uh, optimization problem where you have a large uh, high level, um, uh, first level uh, minimization problem with the slack variables uh, that impose the limits on a second uh, uh, optimization, nested optimization program, uh, which is uh, maximization over X. And here, uh, it looks very hard, this problem, because it's uh, bilinear in K and X. Uh, if you expand this, for instance, even here, you see that K multiplies Y, which is a linear function of X. So all these constraints uh, turn out to be bilinear in uh, X and uh, K. However, what you can do is you can take this, uh, this actually a linear min-max problem. And there is a, a trick which is uh, very well known that you can take the dual of the inner optimization problem and the um, uh, X that was in the constraints goes to the uh, cost function of this maximization problem. And, uh, and so what happens is that if you take the dual, you get a mean mean problem that you can solve and you get a, a single linear problem where that you can solve with respect to K. So in summary, uh, all these steps of the basic approach, you define, um, you take your uh, uh, environment, you define a decomposition in terms of converged regions. You solve the path planning problem at the high level, uh, meaning from one region to the next. This path tells you for each region, uh, which is the phase that you should move toward and uh, um, what are the walls that you should avoid. And then you can solve the, um, uh, you can uh, formulate all the um, uh, constraints. You get a min max problem, which you can take the dual of the near problem and solve as a linear program to find the controller K for each region. And then what you can do is for any initial condition, you look in what region are, you pick the K, you measure, you take the Y, and you um, compute uh, K times Y, you get your input U and you apply to your robot and you navigate toward the um, region. And this, you can do it essentially, um, uh, the controller will ensure that um, you'll never hit the walls um, just by applying this controller. So you don't have to add any other additional obstacle avoidance controller. Uh, this, uh, <coughs> an example of the results, so here we took an apartment floor plan uh, as an example. Uh, we um, made a cell decomposition and uh, we applied the method for each uh, cell. Uh, then we here we show for three example start locations. Uh, we apply the controller for each cell and you can see the discontinuities here. It's where you switch from one cell to the next. And, but you see that um, uh, you plan once and then by from any starting location, you successfully navigate to the goal. One interesting thing that we noticed uh, with this approach is that now what you can do is you actually can deform the environment. So imagine that like the map you got while planning is not entirely accurate. Reality is a little different. Uh, what happens is the if the landmarks also move in the same way as the environment deforms, you can think of the landmarks sort of as candles of a spline. Um, and um, since the landmarks move together with the environment, also the controller, uh, the controller remains the same, so you don't replan. However, the control action you take is actually going to change because the location of the uh, landmarks have changed. And so what happens is that you can um, still navigate while avoiding the walls, uh, despite the fact that you didn't see this environment beforehand. It's just like a deformed version of your um, uh, what you plan on. And there are limits to like how robust this uh, can be. Uh, but it's nice that you have, we have this empirical uh, proof that uh, we can be robust to this um, imperfect map knowledge. <clears throat> so the advantage of this um, uh, approach is that we don't get nominal paths, but we uh, directly get feedback controllers. So uh, we don't have to make the distinction between like high level planning and low level 
uh, feedback controller we directly plan for the feedback controller and um, since we are essentially just solving running this Dystra a star or uh, and then uh, um, solving in our programs this is very fast and you can uh, um, uh, and we saw that the results are robust um, the limitation of this um, uh, approach however uh, are that uh, it assumes that all landmarks are visible at all times. Uh, so the controller K needs to be multiplied by the entire vector Y. Uh, <clears throat> it does not consider the effect of noise. So what happens if you uh, have noise in the measurements? And uh, one big is that if I give you um, um environment which is not like a nice, uh, uh, with nice straight walls, uh, what do you do for finding the cell uh, decomposition, which itself can be a hard task. <coughs> so uh, the next uh, few slides, I'm going to uh, work quickly on uh, how we handle all these three limitations. So uh, regarding the um, uh, fact that not all landmarks uh, might be visible, so this might be due, for instance, because the landmark could be occluded by objects in the room or like uh, on the regions. And uh, or you might just have like a limited field of view camera, uh, and we'll see in the experiment at the end here. Um, this is exactly the case. And so, what do you do if you only see one environment? So you could do um, um, uh, apply the approach that Warren Dixon uh, was using uh, at the beginning of this workshop. So, for instance, you could try to estimate the location of the landmarks even when they are not uh, outside the field of view. And um, that's a completely sensible approach. However, one uh, advantage is that here we have linear controllers. Uh, we're dealing with linear controllers. And so we can uh, play the tricks that are um, um, that uh, make linear control so nice to work with. And in practice, um, we can rewrite our linear controller as a summation of contributions, where our matrix K can be divided in uh, a small matrix K, each one for each landmark. And then the, our total controller is just going to be the summation of all these contributions. And it turns out that um, by a simple change of variables, you can actually reparameterize the controller to depend only on the controllers that you actually see. So um, without replanning from Ki, you can compute some Ki prime and K prime um, just by knowing like which landmarks are visible and which are not. And uh, you can then apply your this uh, modified controller without the, um, uh, by just the landmarks that you actually see. And here we just need one landmark um, uh, or more. And uh, the nice thing is that here we you don't tell us to resolve the linear program or uh, know the map. This just by knowing ki and what is the set of visible landmarks, you can just uh, do reparameterization and you can. Uh, compute exactly the same control that you had before. <coughs> uh, the next is what if you have uh, uncertainty uh, in the environment? So we had constraints that we said, uh, if uh, the control satisfies these constraints, then you are ensured to uh, avoid all the walls. Well, if you have noise, then your trajectory might actually bring you outside uh, these um, regions because the constraints get violated because of noise. And so you might have collisions. Uh, so, in, but you can take uh, this into account uh, while planning. So, what we do, uh, we transform all these linear constraints into quadratic chains constraints. So, we assume that the landmarks are measuring not exactly, but are uh, uh, Gaussian. Uh, they're affected by corrupted by Gaussian noise with some uh, given covariance matrix. And uh, so, given this covariance matrix. Um, you can transform uh, these linear constraints into quadratic chains constraints. And then you can give me what uh, some desired level of uh, some probability of not hitting the obstacle. And I can uh, find, uh, fix these uh, quadratic chains constraints. And then the, the only thing is that the linear program now becomes a quadratic program. And it's a little bit uh, harder to um, uh, solve. Uh, in terms of computational complexity, but it's still you can still it's still convex. You can still solve it uh, optimal uh, to optimality. 
And uh, the interesting thing is that in order to actually satisfy that you never actually, um, uh, you have priority one of not hitting the um, walls. Uh, the only way to guarantee that is to have a function that when you are close to the walls, your measurement of knowing that you are uh, touching the wall is zero. And this makes sense because you can always have, uh, for instance, a contact sensor that tells you when you are against a wall, you know that you are touching the wall. And so you get that uh, uh, measuring with very low noise. And uh, this is the result for the robust formulation. So the left, it's uh, just the basic formulation that we saw before. The middle is uh, with a little bit of level of noise. And um, uh, in final, <coughs> the third, it's with a level of noise which is actually larger than what we accounted for while optimizing. And in fact, if you look at the standard deviation uh, of this noise, it's actually in the order of the width of the wall. So it's very, very high noise. But despite that, uh, we can see that we can still get trajectories that are very noisy, but there are very low chance of hitting the wall. <coughs> and finally, what do you do if you have no polygonal environments? Uh, we take an approach inspired by our T star. And so given the environment, uh, we assume that we can uh, sample uh, points in the environment. And some samples are going to be in red, meaning that are inside the uh, obstacle. Some others are in uh, collision free. And you can build uh, then a tree that um, goes from um, um, that goes from any location in the environment to the goal. So we take these three and uh, we simplify it in order to take the minimum amount. Uh, these are just some heuristics that we use to minimize the number of um, uh, nodes in the tree that you need to represent the entire environment. And then what we build our cell decomposition based on these three. So for instance, consider you have these three samples. Uh, the tree tells you to go from this sample to the <coughs> this node and then toward the goal. And you have some samples that are from the collisions with the um, obstacles. Uh, so we generate uh, um, uh, cells which are essentially just Boronoi regions. And then we um, create an, uh, an approxy linear approximation of where the obstacles are by essentially placing virtual walls where that uh, exclude the um, uh, your goal essentially where to go for the next cell from the samples that uh, you have um, uh, that represent your obstacles. And then we definitely, we simply apply uh, the basic formulation here. So you find, make the linear constraints, you solve the linear problem and you get your control. This is just uh, essentially a better way to find a, a discretization of the environment where you cannot uh, represent the environment as polygons and you only have a sampling function. Um, and uh, the next thing is that in respect to uh, other um, uh, methods based on RRT, we actually get uh, entire controllers. So even if you are not starting in a location where you have uh, that it's covered directly by the tree, there is not near one of the nodes, this control, you can just apply the controller and you will, controller will guide you to, toward the next step in the tree. And so you can uh, essentially extend the tree to the entire environment. <coughs> this is an implementation uh, that we did in uh, the Bureau Robotics Lab. Uh, we use uh, April tags to get uh, the landmark measurements. And here it's completely um, uh, vision based. So we don't use any motion capture. Uh, all the computations are done uh, on board of the, the Raspberry Pi on the robot. And you see that uh, this is an example where the robot can navigate, essentially uh, navigate around the environment. And then we uh, can also deform the environment, so change a little bit the shape, and uh, change the lane, uh, also the placement of the landmarks to be consistent with this change. And you can see that uh, you still um, uh, can um, uh, navigate the successfully the environment over the goal. Um, current uh, and future work. Uh, we are trying to extend this from uh, just um, until now we um, assume full relative position measurements and we are um, uh, working on extending this to molecular images. Uh, you can still with 
can still uh, apply pretty much the same formulation. You just need to go a level deeper in the terms of taking the dual. Um, then we are uh, looking also at problems where, for instance, you know that this landmark is on a specific wall, but you don't know exactly where on the wall. And you can be robust also on this uh, uh, uncertainty of where the landmark is. And finally, uh, as I mentioned, this uh, joint project with some neuroscientists, uh, we are looking at uh, what if you don't have like uh, measurements that are like from uh, April tags or like um, uh, feature extraction, but are more like the uh, in neural response that you see in the brain, how can you uh, uh, use this kind of measurement in the same kind of uh, formulation? Uh, so the takeaways of uh, this talk is that we presented um, a way to synthesize controllers uh, using robust optimization that are very easy to implement. And um, this formulation is robust, is, uh, can be made robust to uncertainty in the environment. Uh, meaning that you don't need to have the exact map and uh, also in the measurements. And uh, with this, I want to thank uh, my students, Baru and uh, Chen Fei, that uh, did most of this work. Thank you for listening. And uh, I also thank the support of ONR that, um, uh, for this work. And thank you. Uh, thanks, Roberto. This was really cool. Um, there are a couple of interesting questions from Patricio, um, and I actually had questions along similar lines about the existence of solutions. Um, maybe you want to take a quick look at those. Uh, but I know oh, I believe we are in lunch break, so if you want to take a look at them really quick, yeah. if you have so thoughts. I'll I'll try with I'll start with the second one. Um, so the um, uh, the Slack variables. Uh, I didn't include it in the slides, but there is actually an additional constraint that the Slack variables needs to be negative. So all the constraints need to be satisfied exactly. And um, so that you actually, the, the solution that you get, either you the solution, <coughs> the problem comes back uh, that it's infeasible. And so you can, you say that your environment is too complex to find a solution and the optimization will tell you that uh, or it will find a solution which is uh, valid for the entire uh, cell. The trick here is that uh, when you take the dual, you're actually implicitly optimizing for all the axes. So you don't have to uh, do an actual like uh, explicit search on what is the worst case uh, location, but you can actually optimize over the entire uh, um, internal uh, um, cell in a single LP. Uh, regarding the first question, um, as I said, um, maybe at the beginning I didn't wasn't entirely clear, but for here we you, we assume that we have linear measurements. Uh, that's why everything becomes an LP. Uh, we are working on uh, making incorporating monocular vision, which are non-linear. And uh, one thing, uh, how we are approaching this, we are trying different approaches. But one is uh, you can think of, you don't really know where the landmark is at any given point, uh, but you can have uh, either assuming or you can from estimate some, uh, um, uh, I, we can have some idea on uh, what is the closest distance and the maximum distance that, that the landmark can be, and then take that into account and. Uh, uh, optimize your controller to take uh, all those uh, controls in uh, all those cases into account so that uh, you don't actually need to know the depth because they are robust to any depth inside these constraints. Um, so I hope this uh, answers the questions. 